You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. So how did one Seattle unhoused, we can't say homeless anymore, unhoused to hotels program work? The results are mixed. And by mixed, we mean mm, not so good. That's what we're talking about today. We've got a KUOW, that's our NPR station. And I know what you're thinking. You might, some of you might say, well, that's the national propaganda radio. We're going to take a look at a quick article from NPR. And then we're also going to look at um, something going on in kind of my neighborhood here in Redmond territory, Bellevue ter- ter- territory, Microsoft area. It has to do with this as well. And it's not, it's not good either. All right. Before we jump on in, if you're new here, my name is Sean Reynolds. I own a couple of real estate companies and I read the news. Some say reasonable people enjoy hearing. All right, let's do this. So how did one Seattle, how did one Seattle unhoused to hotels program work? Mm, mm, The results are mixed. At the beginning of the pandemic, Seattle and King County tried a new approach to get people living in homeless encampments into stable housing. They started putting people up in hotels with the ultimate goal of keeping people off the streets. Some new data suggests that that approach may not be a silver bullet in solving the issue. What do you mean? Take people with the same mental issues, addiction issues, whatever they've else got going on in life and just put them a different physical structure doesn't solve the issues. Oh my gosh. I am no psychologist. Don't pretend to be not very good at discussing my feelings, but even I can kind of understand, oh, that, yeah, this may not be the silver bullet in solving the issue. You're literally taking people off the streets and so many different things gets people to where they are on the streets. Sometimes it's voluntarily, oftentimes it's not. Sometimes towards, you know, months in or years in. They just gotten used to a lifestyle and they're kind of stuck there. But if, if, if city entities like the city of Seattle or King County comes along and says, Hey, would you like a nice hotel? I mean, I want a hotel. I just want to hang out in a hotel. I, I like hotels. That's literally what they're getting. And then we wonder, why isn't this solving the issue? I don't really understand. Seattle Times reporter Sydney Brownstone has been reporting on the efforts of a coalition called Just Care. She told KUOW's Kim Malcolm about what happened to the residents of an encampment at 8th Avenue South and South King Street in Seattle. Just Care is the entity that cleared out, that worked with the residents and cleared out the uh, encampment due to the south of the King County Courthouse, um, worked for weeks there. And, and they've also been working with encampment residents at a number of other and campus as well, you, you'll see Just Care fairly often. And what they do is they do outreach, talk with folks, get them on a list, get start working with them, and then eventually get them into a hotel. And that's kind of where we're at. So Kim from Kim Malcolm, she is from the radio station KUOW. Uh, this new approach was, we're not here to clear you out. We'd like to offer you your own hotel room. How did that go over? How do you think that went over? You, you like a hotel? You're sleeping in a tent on the sidewalk. You could get killed at any moment, and that does happen. Your tent could get burned up. Would you like? Would you like to go into a hotel? That's a pretty good offer. If you can literally get into a hotel, you're going to take that right off the bat. It went very well. This is from Sydney Brownstone, Seattle Times. It went very well. I was at the King Street encampment with Just Care outreach workers. They were walking people, uh, walking up to people and asking, hey, can I get a hotel? It was really different from what I'd previously seen previously. In the past, the navigation team or city staffers or police would come in and say, you got to get out, but here's what we can offer you. It was congregate shelter or basic emergency shelter. People would say, no, thanks. I can't take my stuff there. I don't feel safe there. My partner can't be there. My dog can't be there. There were a lot of reasons why people had for preferring to stay outside. So oftentimes, those are the things that I kind of look at and go, okay, if you really want to get off the streets, and you really want to make this go, here are some of the things you're going to have to do. You are choosing not to do that. Okay, where's the happy medium here? But with hotel rooms, it was actually something that people wanted. I like hotel rooms too. 
this initial experiment with the South King Street encampment showed that before the parking lot was clogged with tents and after all the tents were gone, and there wasn't police with the garbage truck and city workers coming in to say, you have to get out of here. How many people actually took them up on that offer and went into a hotel room is the question. I don't have the hard number of people who are living at the encampment, but I knew, do know that outreach workers evaluated 78 people at the encampment for hotel rooms, all right? And 57 people came inside. That ratio is pretty big. Well, sh temporarily, sure, they want to get off the streets. I mean, homeless encampments, there's a lot of, if you've been a follower of the Seattle Real Estate Podcast, I've done numerous stories on some of the things that happen in there. And some of the things happening to your fellow human beings are pretty hor horrific. They're, I mean, they're just not good. Not good. Let's leave it at that. Flash forward 10 months on. There were 10 months beyond this point where they're starting to talk about taking people from this uh, encampment. Uh, 10 months on, you decided to check back in on this. What happened to those 57 people who were placed in a hotel? So we're, we're doing a little, little checkup here. We know that at least 20 of them are gone and probably back on the streets. All right, 20 out of 57. So we know that at least 20 of them are gone and probably be back on the streets. 20 of them either left the program voluntarily or they were kicked out because of safety issues, doing illegal things, violating the lodging agreement, or just not working with case management. All right, so they get into a hotel, enjoy the hotel, buy some time, and then eventually there's safety issues. They're doing stuff they shouldn't be doing, right? They're doing illegal things, there's rules and they're violating the hotel lodging agreement or they're just not working with case management. Hey, F you, I got a hotel room. I'm going to do what I want till you kick me out. I came from a tent. You know, I can manage this. I can work on this. It's exactly what's going on, right? So we don't know what happened to 16 of them, just gone. We know that six people got into permanent housing. All right, six out of 78. Ooh, for these kind of shelter programs, that's not bad, the six, okay, which says something about the shelter system itself. But if you look at the rate of unsuccessful exits, 20 out of 57, more than a third, that is extraordinarily high. Mm, yeah. Plus, we don't know what happened to 16 of them. So that's 36 out of 57. What we do know is that six out of 57, so let's call it 10% got into permanent housing. We don't know how they're going to do. What do they have a 50% attrition rate? So let's call it, let's, let's, let's just for argument's sake, let's say that three out of 78 work out. Three out of 78. All right, less than 5%, less than 5%. And so we have a population, a uh, homeless population in Seattle of, I don't know, is it 12,000? Is it 6,000? I hear numbers all the time, all over the board, 5,000, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, you encompass everybody. All right. So 90, let's just, let's just call it 95% of those are going to stay on the streets. That's what we're saying with this hotel program. That's kind of where we're at. That's tough. And, and that's with a whole bunch of them just not even taking up the hotel offer, right? So what are people learning about what worked in that scenario and what didn't? I think the first is that when you actually offer services that people want, the idea of service resistance kind of disappears. All right, but we're not necessarily talking about service here, are we? We are talking about offering somebody a hotel room, which is a great, great thing. I mean, you get a free hotel room. Who doesn't want that? That's especially when you've come from living on the streets. That's brutal. It's brutal out there. It's not fun. But then they've got the option of, oh, I got to live with rules. I can't do the drugs. Oh, I can't be with this person. Uh, stuff I'm doing to support my drug habit. It's, 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 it's sketchy at best. It's illegal at worst. So. You're offering them something amazing. Of course, they're going to take it with all with the wraparound services. Mm, that's where the fallout starts to happen, right? Because they got to live by rules. 
they don't necessarily want to remove by rules. The second thing is that there is a difference between addressing encampments and addressing homelessness. True. Homelessness, what gets people into that scenario? Encampments, sweeping out campments, encampments, two wildly different issues, right? If you are solely looking at this issue as we have to clean up encampments, the solutions are temporary. We understand that. Uh, we understand that. But then we're kind of looking at, you know, as tax paying citizens, we're looking at going, okay, so we're buying these hotels, we're bu buying a lot of hotels. And I'm going to talk about a hotel we're buying here soon. We're buying these hotels, we're putting these people in there, a fraction of them are actually turning their lives around. Is this the best we can do? That's always my question is, I, I am no sociologist. And, and again, no psychologist, I you know, I can barely work in my own head, let alone try and figure out, okay, how can we help you get off the streets? How can we help you manage your drug addiction? How can we help you manage your mental issues that your mental health care issues that are obviously overriding your life? I, I was watching or was reading a story this morning about a guy, where was he? Uh, outside of a school, he was having a, a manic episode or schizo episode. He had a knife and he was banging on people's windows as they're driving their kids up to the school. They interviewed him later and he said, Hey, I, I did that. But I, I let everybody know that I, I don't mean to harm anybody. I just had one of these schizoid episodes and I barely remember what happened. So let everybody know that it's going to be okay, that I'm harmless. But you have a dude coming up with a knife banging on your window, who's just screaming and won't stop. I mean, some some dudes, some crazy, literally crazy dude has a knife running up on your car with your kids in the backseat as you're trying to take little Johnny and Susie to elementary school. Oof, that gets a little bit tricky. And this is in this is in Kirkland. Think Kirkland brand from Costco. That's the original Kirkland. That's east side. That's just to the north of me here. Um, we don't deal with a lot of stuff like that. But it, there's an area where there's a whole bunch of RVs. And this guy's came from the RV and he's got mental stuff going on. And I mean, you put that take that guy from an RV and put him in a hotel, it doesn't take care of the stuff that he's got going on in his head. You've just moved locations. So this whole thing about trying to get him off the streets into a hotel. And it's this it's this big, huge ball of issues, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's humanity and humanity is complex and especially people on the streets, they've gotten there because uh, things haven't worked out in their life for one reason or another. And um, also, how about, like, I think it was a Oregon just said, hey, bring all the people from Kabul here, we'll take them. And a lot of you sent that in and said, um, yeah, but you can't take care of your own homeless. You've literally got thousands of homeless that you can't take care of. What business do you have? taking on refugees from a foreign country. You've got Oregonians that should be number one on the list, right? Everybody's got a different viewpoint of what should or shouldn't happen. I kind of think take care of your own first, and then you can figure that out. And then you start working elsewhere. If you can't take care of your own family. What are you doing screwing around with this other stuff? It's good to help people, but help what's right in front of you first, right? So the article goes on to say, so we got people inside, but then eventually they went back out on the streets for a number of reasons. Yep, makes sense. Also, the connection to permanent housing isn't a direct one. If we were trying to solve homelessness, we would be doing everything we could to get people into permanent housing. And those resources have not been available to date. So we're doing this kind of here in King County, we're doing this, this deal where you're buying up a whole bunch of hotels, and then sticking the homeless people in them, basically ruining those communities. I mean, I just did a podcast, I think it was two days ago. And I was talking about the Uptown Espresso. It's been there for 37 years in Lower Queen Anne. So think uh, Seattle Space Needle, not far from there, a couple of blocks from there. And Uptown Espresso, they're closing after 37 years in business because the King County purchased a hotel called the Inn at Queen Anne, and they've got one of these deals there. They've got the you know temporary housing and hotel. They've converted the hotel into temporary housing, and that area has gone 
straight downhill. So the owners talk about, yeah, people are urinating inside our store. They're defecating sometimes in our store, tapping right outside of our store. You know, nobody wants to come here because they have to get past all this stuff. The same thing we talk about on a tourism level. Hey, come to Seattle. Just, you know, we, we got to play that dodge the human feces in the sidewalk game. But who doesn't love that? That's a fun game. Yeah, you know, people are doing stuff out there. And it's happening. And it's right out there. And um, I had a what did I have today? Oh, somebody sent me this anonymously, of course. Uh, due to increased criminal activity in and around our office, the building owner has recommended that we temporarily lock elevator access to open public floors, including, uh, our sixth floor office. We apologize for this inconvenience. If you have a need to visit our offices, we will continue to have a staff member at the front desk. You can contact to gain access to this, to the sixth floor. As a reminder, you can likely complete your business without a trip to our offices. Don't come here. Too dangerous. Offices horrible location. And that's in downtown Seattle, Fourth Avenue. Mm. Send out a memo like that to, to your clients. Yeah, we'd love to have you come to the office. But there's that that whole issue of crime and homelessness. And whew, it's not a good look. Let's just do everything online. Let's just let's just, you know, do everything online. Since when do we do that? I mean, this is literally what what it's come to is yeah, don't go down there. It's not safe. We're closing our offices. We're not having access to the elevator. We're closing our business, whatever. So, so there wasn't a clear path is the next question from the, ho the hotel room to permanent housing. No, it's a pretty complicated path between a shelter and permanent housing. The program figured that maybe they could expedite this through something called rapid rehousing rental subsidy vouchers. Those are expected to be distributed to the program coming up. But the problem with these types of vouchers is that they're time limited. They can only help you between six months and a year. For people who have been living on the streets for long periods of time, that might not be an appropriate intervention. Okay, so we ran through the numbers. It's not good. Those are dis disappointing numbers. Um, if we're going to be, and by we, I mean taxpayers' money going into purchasing hotel rooms, purchasing literally entire hotel complexes, converting them into this, I would want to see those numbers up a little bit. I don't know how to get that. I don't know how to get there. I don't know what services they need to help these people. Are these people, can you help these people? I don't know. That's why I, it, as much of this stuff as I can read, I will and um, just kind of keep bringing it up because this is an issue. It's an issue issue on our West Coast cities and East Coast cities that, you know, with political leadership in place, this isn't going away. This is, it's not good. All right. Let's talk about not in my backyard. Literally, this is my backyard. Redmond neighbors demand transparency in homeless hotel purchase. What this is, is this is an old silver cloud in uh, that is being converted. It's about 17 blocks from my home, from where I live in Bellevue, Redmond border, literally like a couple of miles from my office here. I have a terrible commute. I mean, if, if it's bad, it's seven minutes. If it's fast, it's like six. I don't know. It's something like that. And is it two, two miles? I don't even know that. Don't care. It's under 10 minutes. I can get here pretty quick. That's all I really care about. Um, but city of Redmond with King County, I'm going to read this article here, purchased a hotel that will be used to provide housing for people experiencing chronic homelessness, but residents say they weren't warned. And that's what I have an issue with is the county and the city just identifies a hotel that's zoned for hotel right? Hotel, you can't just pop a hotel up anywhere willy nilly. It's got to be the appropriate zoning and use and got to go through all that. But if the city if the mayor and the city council and King County just want to buy a property and just do whatever willy nilly to it, apparently that's that's okay that you don't have to have any disclosure to the public, you just go in there. And, ah, that's okay. This will work out just fine. I'm sure. That sparked concern from neighbors, including Can Kui, the founder of a group called Safe East Side. Now I've got those little political signs, but they're not political. They're just like 
stop the free needle exchange program, safety east side. So I, I don't, and I've heard that with the homeless encampment, oftentimes they hand out needles. I don't know. That's rumor, but that's what's on the signs is stop needle exchange in your backyard. I get it. I understand. That's a huge concern. I spent a lot of time over in Seattle and now I'm looking around all the time going, oh, yep, there's a cap to a hypodermic needle. Oh, there's a hypodermic needle itself. No lie. I mean, you just encounter that all over the city. It's so prevalent. And taxpayers dollars pays for clean needles, clean needle exchange. I mean, it just happens. We have a big problem with the location, Kui told the Jason Rant show on KTTH about the hotel. It's right between Bellevue, the busiest traffic section of Bellevue and Redmond. So it is. It's on what's called Bell Red Road, which is, or it's very close to Bell Red Road, which is what my office is abutting to. Um, busiest traffic section of Bellevue and Redmond. And although it's within Redmond borders, it's affecting a lot of residential areas in Bellevue. And the residential areas are just to the east and to the south. So it's kind of on this outskirt area. And then we've got um, we've got Microsoft just right up the road. So we're just going to buy a little hotel, a little Silver Cloud Inn, and do a little reno and start loading the homeless people in there with less than a 5% chance that this will work out in their favor long term. Most of them will just seep into the community, do what they were doing before on the streets, now just in a different location because they're used to a different location. As far as the transparency of the deal, we also have a problem with that. He said for government to spend taxpayer dollars to purchase a property and not notify anybody in the neighborhood and purchase that property convert to a different use for homeless use. That's a travesty to the neighborhood. It is. It really is. And this is where that not in my backyard comes in, right? Because we're all like, Oh, I don't, I don't want that by my home. And I don't want it by my home. But where do you put it? Where do you put it? Uh, and like one of my one of my kids said, just put them way the F out there. Just put them way out there. Okay, but then they don't have access to the services and they don't have cars and they can't get around. They're kind of isolated and they're just out there and that doesn't really fix the whole got to have, you know, wraparound services that can work with them. Or you bring all that to that physical structure way the F out there. And then you've basically got a loony bin. You've got an insane asylum, right? Where there's just it's locked up compound, you know, with the big fences around it, like you used to see kind of like Rain Man, Tom Cruise uh, movie, where Dustin Hoffman is, you know, he's been in this institution for years and years and years. Kind of like that, this institution way out there, is that is that the solution? Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe that's what we need to go back to. I don't know. But we've basically emptied all those institutions out, right? Because we deemed them to not be humanitarian. And uh, we emptied all those out. We've emptied out the prisons. And we wonder why we've got these issues with homelessness where we're offering people a hotel room and they're taking it for a little bit, but then they can't stay within the confines of the program and they end up moving on. Kui says people in Seattle who have gone through a similar ordeal contacted them, and basically told us that it will be a nightmare for you. He says he spoke with one woman from Green Lake for two hours who lives next to a homeless settlement. Then her neighborhood for the last couple of years was just ruined, full of trash, needles all over the place, and then the crime rate is up, and the neighborhood people were just afraid of walking outside, Kui said. All right. Yeah. Not looking forward to that. That's a no-go. And then what happens? Reasonable people start to move. They leave. And then it just becomes this wasteland, right? And then you're like, I don't know how that happened. What what happened here? Oof. Hmm. At this point, since the city of Redmond is responsible for the location of the hotel and the permitting for converting its use, Gui says Safe East Side believes the mayor is the person responsible for this deal. Oh, Mayor Redmond. What'd you get us into? In the meantime, we also have questions for King County as well, he added. Right now, as of this point, the mayor barely responds to our comments. Her only public response is, she said, the day after our Tuesday protest last week, she said she was still going to move on with the project. I bet you there's some good money involved there, right? Mm, yeah. Get some funding. Hey, 
How's a little hotel in your hood? Here's your funding. We're demanding for transparent transparency and public input, Kui said. Um, yeah, so there's that. What I would like is to know the oversight. If you want to put a hotel, if you want to convert a hotel into uh, into housing for the homeless or whatever that is, uh, let's take a look and see what the rules are so that there can be some rules and some guidelines that said residents have to live by so that the community doesn't get just overrun with this. What does that look like? I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that happen. Because then you've got the ability to say, okay, here's the rule, not following it. What are you going to do about it? Probably nothing. Probably like they're the mayor of uh, Redmond's response right now, which is, it sounds like nothing. Because the deal got cut. This is what they're doing. It's going down. Any which way, I'll cover this right here on the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Because now, now we're literally in my backyard. All right, let the fun begin. This, I mean, and I'm not making fun of any of this. It's just, this is the reality. And um, this is going to impact one of my favorite 7-Elevens that I love going to on the corner of Northeast 24th. It's on the Northeast corner of Northeast 24th and Bell Red Road. Adjacent to that is a Chevron that I love going to. It's been renovated, got a great car wash. I mean, the family that runs that, they're phenomenal. I, I just, you know, I think they're great. Um, we've got Trader Joe's. We've got a Walgreens. Um, all good stores. They're going to have a tough time with this homeless encampment basically, you know, sprouting up in a hotel. Tough times. There's a karate shop. There's There's just all kinds of stuff right in this area. It's a dense kind of suburban shopping area ish. And it's the first one on the east side that I know of that's kind of this far east. So we're getting that pressure from Seattle This is going to happen. So I will keep you posted right here in the Seattle real estate podcast. Thanks so much for being here. That's it for me on this one. Um, yeah, to be continued. How about that? Thanks for being here again. I'll see you soon. We'll talk then. Till then, stay safe. Bye for now. to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.